Hello and thank you very much for tuning in to the podcast series by the New Silk Road Project. I'm your host today, Charles Stevens, the founder of the New Silk Road Project. This series is dedicated to understanding and raising awareness of one of the most important development strategies of the 21st century, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The centerpiece of the New Silk Road Project, an initiative supported by Jeep, CSIS, Magellan Capital, the University of St. Andrews and Dennis Shirah, was to travel the course of the Silk Road Economic Belt from London to Yiwu in eastern China, interviewing the key actors and academics along its course. We will have to apologise in advance for some of the tangential moments in this podcast series and also the variable quality of audio footage. We do hope this series sheds important light into China's growing global presence and the significant changes taking place across Eurasia. Tristan Kenderdine, Research Director at Future Risk in Almaty, provided a great deal of insight into how China's industrial strategy may be the key in understanding and decoding the mystery and opaqueness which often characterises the Belt and Road Initiative. He sees it as a way of exporting the antiquated industries in China to surrounding regions to help facilitate China's movement up the global value chains. This helped to take us away from the simplicity which can often characterise the Belt and Road Initiative, and we very, very much enjoyed speaking with him. Uh, sure. Well, I'm just finishing a PhD in um, <clears throat> uh, China's external industrial policy over the past five years. Um, before that, I was working in commissioned research in Beijing, uh, and I have, uh, uh, have academic interests in international relations and political economy, um, and I started off life as a, as a history student. And we discussed earlier that the Belt and Road Initiative has two main components, the, the Maritime Road and also the, the land-based belt. Could you discuss um, how these two intersect and um, how they work together to diversify China's energy strategy? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the important thing to, to talk about there is that the, the, the Maritime Silk Road part of, of this plan doesn't really need very much to change. Uh, most of the, the in, in, economic institutional architecture is there. Most of the global trade system is there. Um, the, the, the Maritime Silk Road, the only real problem there is talking about the Strait of Malacca and a resurgent Chinese or a new Chinese position in the Indian Ocean uh, in terms of uh, security um, and geoeconomics. So most of that stuff can happen uh, fairly clearly under the old institutional lines. We can set up... Um, industrial manufacturing in East Africa or the Middle East uh, and just simply ship it back to China uh, or, or ship it to, to Pakistan. Not much has to change there. So most of the institutional changes, most of the, the, the structural uh, and policy uh, and international capital problems or, 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 or developments that we see happen along the land route uh, where there's less economic um, uh, advantage, less economic uh, opportunity. Um, which is a kind of a strange balance. So most of the, the economic uh, development should happen around Indian Ocean uh, economies, whereas most of the, um, most of the structural uh, policy is aimed towards Caspian Rim um, economies. So it, it's tempting to, to research more on the, the, the Belt Road because it's uh, you know, the great game and it's, uh, it's exciting and you know, there's it, it, a lot of imagination involved in it. Um, but I think you can only really... Uh, look at the Caspian Rim economies and the the um, the, the belt uh, development uh, in tandem with the, the much wider um, uh, developments in the, the Indian Ocean, uh, particularly in the Middle East and East Africa. I mean, it seems to be that what you're saying that to understand the Belt and Road Initiative, you need to look at the economics, not the geopolitics, focusing on. China's internal development strategy. Would you be able to discuss that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think absolutely it's a, it's a geoeconomic policy. Um, everyone can analyse geopolitics over the top of that, um, but it's a geoeconomic policy designed specifically to transfer China's industrial production um, from the, the domestic Chinese mainland uh, to China's external geographies. Now, that's quite clear. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity around uh, the, the wider Belt and Road Initiative, but what I've been following is a um, a much clearer uh, structural policy shift called international capacity cooperation, 
um, which is already in a quite advanced stage of deployment. Um, it came out in 2015, uh, and it's the guiding principles uh, and policy directives, which help to help local governments in, in China decide which capital, which industries um, that it can move from um, the domestic Chinese uh, mainland out to external geographies along the Belt and Road. Um, so once you start looking at it in terms of um, I call it a geo-industrial policy um, or a parallel trade strategy, um, then you can start to see the, the more granular aspects of China moving its industrial production to these external geographies with the idea of then using those uh, outputs as imports into China as an, event, as an, as an eventual net importer. And what region would you say, or what regions, if you can highlight some, would do you think are most um, are most viable, or, or or this is having most success? And is it targeting one specific region? May that be Central Asia, or is it looking elsewhere? Uh, I think in terms of in terms of policy deployment, um, it's most advanced in Central Asia, but in terms of uh, economic viability, um, probably the economies with the Indian Ocean uh, rims are going to be uh, you know, more likely to uh, benefit from Chinese investment. So I think long term you're looking at East Africa and the Middle East, um, uh, and I think that is, that is uh, the, the more important aspect of the, um, the, the Belt and Road policy. But in terms of um, actual... Uh, industrial policy that's being deployed, China has broken up its industrial sectors uh, and its, uh, its government industrial policy um, devolved to the, to the local level. So to understand which sectors are moving to which uh, external geographies, you need to look at the, obviously the, the policy banks, which are bringing the capital out here to, to, to lend for the infrastructure projects. Um, but there's a whole system at play. It's, called, uh, it's genuinely called uh, one, one province, one country. <laughs> so the whole thing is one belt and one road. And then if you know about Chinese domestic uh, policy, uh, it's deployed at a local level. So you say one province to one country. So you say to Hebei province, you have too much steel. Uh, I know uh, a nice country that you could be matched with called Kazakhstan. Why don't your industries go and talk to the Kazakh uh, people? And so Hebei province, which is the, the steel complex uh, surrounding Beijing, the new Tianjin, uh, Jinjinji, uh, is, is, is effectively match made um, to the Kazakh economy. Can, can, can BRI then be seen as a coherent strategy if it's broken down onto such a, a, a regional, even local level? Yes, absolutely. I think the, there's been a lot of talk about it being a, a, an unwieldy or, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, a, 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 a too big a policy to actually work. But I'm looking clearly at the Chinese bureaucracy and how the industrial um, uh, policy machine uh, is moving, uh, moving certain sectors um, abroad. And if you look at that level, then you can see quite clearly how different things can work and how the, the, the smaller components of the policy can work. In terms of whether the whole thing can work um, holistically, I'm still a little uh, pessimistic about that. But if you look at, uh, at, at aluminium in Kazakhstan, or um, you look at the, uh, uh, there's also an aluminium smelter in, in Bukhara and in, in, in Uzbekistan, um, <clears throat> all these little things where you can see, well, uh, structurally and, uh, and in terms of neoclassical economics, um, it works. Uh, and so if you can start to move uh, certain things at the local level uh, in China abroad, then, it, then I think there is a, a good chance of it working. Where it can fall down there is that China, China is very good at, at, at bilateral relationships at the, the highest level, send the president out, shake hands with the president, sign a, sign a memorandum of understanding, come back, everything's okay. China also works very well vertically in terms of industrial deployment down its, uh, its public uh, administration bureaucracy, then the big problem I see then is that they then need to move horizontally from local governments in China to local governments in Belt and Road host economies. <clears throat> and that's where I see um, potentially some problems arising uh, because <clears throat> I mean, a lot of these local governments in China will have very little experience uh, investing or working abroad and they won't have the the institutional architecture to be able to move and work laterally, whereas they're used to working um, uh, vertically, uh, up and down from the centre, they're now being tasked to move abroad uh, horizontally. And I think that's where, 
if host economies wish to benefit from the Belt and Road, they also need to um, start to develop their institutional capacity in order to dock uh, with the Chinese policy that's coming across. Because I think by themselves, the Chinese local governments uh, probably don't have the capacity to do that. And for how long do you think the financial lending um, through the through the main Chinese multilateral policy banks can be, or even even sort of state state run policy banks? How long can they be? How long can they be attractive for? I mean, increasingly we're seeing the cancellation of twenty billion dollars worth of projects in Myanmar, Bhutan, and Nepal. The recent cancellation in Malaysia. I mean, it seems that the terms of these loans are are putting in potential sort of investors off. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think the biggest problem with this whole uh, policy deployment is uh, exactly that, the lack of transparency um, with these loans. We only start to see the, the interest terms when smaller countries start to default, uh, and we see that governments um, you know, have, have, have taken out loans uh, with their taxpayers' funds that they've been un- unable to pay. Montenegro has had a big problem. Kyrgyzstan here has um, had political problems uh, as a result of the power plant investment. Um, I, I think for the, the, ho- the recipient economies, it is important to make sure that you, you're getting a good uh, interest rate uh, and that you're uh, building a project that benefits the host economy, uh, not simply the Chinese economy. I think on the Chinese side, though, um, most of this capital is coming through the unilateral um, uh, policy banks, um, and, uh, leaving the, the multilateral system behind. And I think that opens up a new set of risks that that any Chinese capital that's coming to Belt and Road economies is exposed to the risk of local government debt in China. And so if you're taking a loan from a Chinese policy bank, you're effectively taking a loan from a Chinese local government, uh, and Chinese local government debt um, is a bit nasty to say the least. So I think there is a large degree of debtor risk um, in host economies taking out loans at uh, not exactly preferential rates, but I think the wider problem is creditor risk and I think that uh, exporting China's um, domestic debt to external economies uh, is very dangerous. And, and you've mentioned that China, China not opening up its capital accounts and, 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 and sending debt off in this way and also establishing the new policy banks, I guess, is a key, a key marker of it. It seems to be setting up a new set of rules and, and, and sort of moving away from the current international system which was established with Bretton Woods and and the US after World War II. Would you, would you say that this is the main aim of the Belt and Road Initiative? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, actually. Um, I've been calling it a parallel trade strategy. Um, uh, you know, what I'm looking at specifically is the, is the geo-industrial policy um, uh, of China exporting its industrial policy uh, domestically to external geographies. But I think the, the broader sense is correct that China... China's moving into the world now, but it's moving in on its own terms. Um, and it's proven over the last five years specifically, but ten years more generally, that it's not converging to the Bretton Woods system, it's not converging to the international institutions. And so I think much like uh, Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, um, China sees its place in the world more on its terms and um, and hopes that the, that the world will... Uh, start moving towards the gravity of its own institutional uh, uh, frameworks and to be able to, and to be able to set standards um, for, for the global economy uh, in parallel with the Bretton Woods system. And do you think from, from, a, from a global perspective that's a good or a bad thing? I think um, overwhelmingly I think that uh, Chinese state policy banking in these external geographies is good for economies like Central Asia because it's a wake-up call um, and a bit of a kick to the multilateral development banks. Uh, I think if anyone's um, uh, threatened um, by Chinese uh, capital uh, and industrial development in Central Asia in particular, um, the adequate response to that is to come here and start lending yourselves. Um, these, are, these are largely economies that were isolated from globalization 1.0. And so if there's any threat to... Um, uh, to, to the global trade and industrial system under globalization 2.0 under China, um, I think that should only spur um, the, the regional development banks uh, and the global development banks um, to, to come here and start lending themselves uh, if they feel threatened by the Chinese investment. And, and I, I, see, I see you as someone who quite likes v- visual images of things and at the moment the, way, the main way that people sort of visualise BRI or at least how I have in the past seen it as, as a train sort of 
sweeping inexorably across the, the, the Eurasian supercontinent. If you were going to suggest one, one image which you think should encapsulate BRI, what is that image to you? Well, it's a steel mill. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's, it's a steel mill. Yeah, well, look, the, yeah, the imagination is, uh, is, Europe and Asia, is uh, Europe and Asia. The imagination is the, tr- the train sweeping across it. The imagination is geopolitics and, and empire great games. Um, what I see for the people of Kazakhstan, the people in Central Asia, uh, mm. is the possibility to import uh, more mm-hmm. industrial development. And so uh, if, uh, when I think of Golden Road, I, th- I think of uh, aluminium smelters, steel smelters, um, more cement, glass, paper, uh, textiles, all these kind of base heavy industrial products um, that go into making a, a broader uh, industrial complex in these economies. And that's why I would, I'd like to see it more in terms of a disaggregated analysis of the, the economies involved from a Kazakhstan perspective or an Uzbekistan perspective or an Azerbaijan perspective um, rather than a, a China, Europe, U, USA um, global geopolitical perspective. And, and when China is, is, is exporting there, or well, trying to become a, a, a net importer and sending their factories abroad, sometimes they're bringing with them antiquated methods, old factories, things that really aren't attractive for companies trying to move up the global value chains. How much of a challenge or a, a roadblock do you think this poses to the success of, of this aspect of the BRI? Yeah, I th- it's a good question. I, I don't think it sh- poses too much of a problem for the Chinese concept of success, um, but maybe to the, the host economies concepts. Um, so China's, uh, I would break down China's uh, uh, investments into three areas like that. We would say East Africa is about um, labor inputs. Um, Central Asia, it, they are trying to uh, offshore outdated uh, industrial capacity. So you're getting old aluminium factories, you're getting old steel smelters, you're getting heavy industrial things that, that China doesn't want to export anymore doesn't want to produce anymore, rather. Um, whereas the Middle East uh, looks like it's really getting um, some high-tech industrial transfers there. So um, uh, uh, nuclear equipment manufacturing uh, plants are going to um, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, uh, uh, UHV um, transmission network going up in, um, in Egypt. Um, and uh, aquaculture... Um, uh, I, think, I think an agriculture complex is going to go up in, in Oman. So across the Middle East, I think uh, China is transferring uh, higher uh, technological um, industries, which do help those economies to, to, to climb higher in the, in the global value chain. But I think you're spot on that in, the, in Central Asia, a lot of the industrial transfers that are occurring are in old heavy industries, um, and that does not help these uh, economies to leapfrog uh, very far at all. And in terms of the people actually running these mills on, 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 on the local level, it's, it's the people and an a, a, a international development strategy will always encounter some resistance, but can it be the success that it wants to be with the level of um, resentment and resistance that it's starting to cause in some places? Yeah, I think that's a big problem, and I think China's not very well prepared for that. Um, they do engineering very well. Um, they do state planning very well. Um, they, they don't do international diplomacy very well. Uh, and they have had a, a system over the last 40 years which has meant that the world has come to them and that they have not had to invest in the kind of um, academic or linguistic um, uh, 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 capital, for lack of a better word, um, that, that you would need to be able to run a, a project uh, of this scale. Um, I was speaking at Peking University a couple of years ago and I was, I was speaking with a professor there uh, of, uh, of Farsi uh, and she was saying she had a handful of students at the best university in, in China. Um, they, they, China's, China's going to struggle diplomatically to have enough Arabic speakers, Farsi speakers, Russian speakers um, to be able to come out here uh, and effectively um, integrate with these economies. So I think that's the biggest challenge, is it looks good on a map. Um, China, it, 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 there's benefits on both sides to moving the industrial sectors uh, uh, to Central Asia. There's benefits to Central Asia for, for um, uh, having greater uh, uh, Chinese capital imports. But as you say, there's a, there's a, there's a latent nationalism here which, rightly or wrongly, perceives China as a threat. Uh, and I think China's going to have a very difficult time 
um, dissuading uh, that that concept of of a China threat in this area, um, because the way that it's been deploying the Belt and Road is very much at the top level. That it, it's talking to elites, it's talking to um, uh, it's talking to people who control capital and industry and government in these countries. And I think at the ground level, unless there's something for the people here. Unless somebody, unless wages start to rise at the at the bottom, unless people start to get better housing, um, more reliable electricity um, and water, these kind of things, that I think the the Chinese diplomatic machine uh, is not in as good a shape as say the United States uh, academic and linguistic system was. Um, I mean, you look at you look at the United States in the 1980s during the Cold War. You could go to any university in America, and you could find a specialist. Uh, who knew an immense amount about a very small part of the world. Uh, I don't think that's good. that's certainly not true of China now. So do you, do you think the establishment the of something future. like the Confucius Institute mm. is, is very sort of introspective rather than a way, a way of more sort of showcasing Chinese culture rather than an attempt to understand other regions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, exactly a great point. If you, a Confucius Institute, uh, a, a wide-scale deployment of Chinese language uh, uh, institutions across the world so that foreigners can learn Chinese. Mm. Well, if if the right Chinese people learned uh, Arabic and Russian uh, and that those people came out here instead, um, then people here would not need to speak so much Chinese. Um, so I think, it, yeah, I think that is detrimental to um, uh, the concept that China might be uh, uh, exporting its own values and governance system uh, through the Belt and Road. And of course, one of the one of the players or, or regions, I should say, that have been most reluctant is, 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 Western, is Western Europe towards endorsing, may that be through MOUs or, or, or just general involvement with, with the Belt and Road Initiative, what do you think can be done to encourage Western Europe to engage in, in, in the way that would be um, mutually beneficial? Uh, I, think, I think for Western Europe, um, uh, two things for Western Europe. One, Western Europe's put an immense amount of uh, capital, time and energy into China's reform and development over the last 40 years. Um, European uh, 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 European firms and European governments have been one of the strongest supporters of China's industrialization. And so uh, if China wants to engage Western Europe a bit more on the, the Belt and Road, um, it's time for China to start opening up more sectors uh, to European investment, European competition. So the first thing China can do um, to help uh, assuage any, any Western European fears is to help open more of its domestic markets. But I think it's going to do that anyway because I think I look at Belt and Road in terms of transitioning China to a net importer. So I think where China is opening up its domestic markets um, to greater European investment um, and competition, uh, that can be a kind of red herring because they were, they, they're giving you something where th they wanted to give away anyway. Uh, I think uh, more of a bitter pill um, that China and European Union could work together on would be in Eastern Europe. And like I said before about Central Asia, if it's, if it's, a, if it's perceived as a threat, as a China capital coming in, um, then match it with, with European capital. If the 16 plus 3 looks like a threat to the European Union, uh, I think if the European Union started um, putting more money into Eastern Europe in, in partnership with China, um, then ultimately that would be of benefit to the countries of Eastern Europe. I mean, if, if what you say that the Belt and Road Initiative is essentially about China becoming a net importer, mm. I mean, it's been looking at doing this for a while, and, 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 and we've seen with other initiatives, may that be sort of, sort of 16 plus 1 and things, you can see sort of the legacies of what has now become the Belt and Road yeah. in them. As a result of this, is, is the Belt and Road Initiative essentially just a rebranding or a marketing strategy? Um, I... Well, I don't think it is. I think I think the Belt and Road Initiative is a, is in some senses a, a, a branding strategy and a, a geopolitical idea, um, w without too many nodules on it that anybody can uh, can connect to. Um, but that's why I've been focusing on international capacity cooperation and looking at the uh, the finer aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. If you disaggregate it and you start looking at the different regional groupings, um, the different ways that China is uh, is engaging with different regions, whether it be the, the Eurasian Economic Union, the SCO, uh, 16 plus 1, um, ASEAN plus 3, uh, these different kind of regional arrangements, uh, coupled with the, the, the more specific uh, enterprise and industrial level um, integration, then I think you do start to get towards something that um, the, the different states and enterprises can engage with. Uh, and at the moment, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, as a, 
as a global idea is a bit too large for anybody to, to really square the circle on. And how do you think public awareness and perceptions towards the Belt and Road Initiative has, has, has changed? I, I, would, I was going to actually ask in Kazakhstan, but considering most of your professional career you have been in China, I mean, may, maybe in China, what's the, the, the general perception and awareness among the people in China of the Belt and Road Initiative? It's huge, actually. I was surprised. I, I, I was working on this in um, 2014 through 2016 in Beijing, uh, and then I was outside of China for most of 2017, and uh, I was just recently back in Beijing. And the thing that struck me the most there is the rise of um, uh, Silk Road or Xinjiang restaurants. Right? Everywhere in Beijing, everyone's eating shashlik, everyone's thinking it's, it's Chinese, and everyone is, uh, has, has caught on to the imagination of the, of the frontier lands of Xinjiang and the, and the Silk Road um, dream. Um, so I think in terms of a, a, a political marketing, um, I, it, it certainly landed with the Chinese population quite well. Um, but I, I do think that's dangerous as well because the, the idea there is that China was the centre of the Silk Road, uh, and if this uh, Belt and Road Initiative is to have any sort of practical benefit, the, the, the gravity needs to shift towards Eurasia. It needs to, needs to be look, uh, you need to be looking at the disaggregated economies here. And in that sense, then, you're coming into a Russian sphere, um, you're going against global institutions. Um, and for me in particular, I think the Russian concept of Eurasianism um, is, is far more advanced than, than, than any kind of Chinese ideology or historical concept of the Silk Road. So I think, again, that even as a big macro concept, um, it's going to rub up against uh, other big ideas. And if you were going to summarise the Belt and Road Initiative in one word, what's that word for you? Uh, risk. <laughs> uh, it's, it's <laughs> it is risk. I mean, there, there are so many layers of risk in this. There's political risk on the Chinese side. Um, there's economic risk on the Chinese side. It, all the small Chinese enterprises are being asked to, to take a pill and, and move out to Uzbekistan that they know nothing about uh, as a huge risk for them. And then on the Central Asian side, to see Chinese capital and Chinese industry coming over the mountains, um, that's an opportunity and a risk.